It's been a long time coming. Ontario's Police Services Act hasn't had a major update since before cell phones and the internet arrived on the scene. Add in public frustration in communities that don't always feel well served by police and the 119 recommendations from Mr. Justice Michael Tullock's Police Oversight Review, and it was time. The government's now put forward the so-called Safer Ontario Act. Will it do the job? Let's find out. We'll ask Rob Jameson, President of the Ontario Provincial Police Association, Mike Metatsawabin, Board Chair for the Nishnabi Aski Police Service, also known as NAPS, Kate Puddister, Assistant Professor in Political Science at the University of Guelph, and Kingsley Gilliam, Director of Communications for the Black Action Defense Committee. And we're delighted to welcome all of you to TVO tonight for what I'm sure will be a stimulating debate about whether we are creating a safer Ontario with the new rules. And Sheldon, if you would, bring up the graphic and we'll go through some of the highlights of a nearly 500-page new bill. This act would overhaul the police disciplinary process, expand the scope of the Special Investigations Unit and publicly release its reports, revamp the investigative body for public complaints against police officers, there'd be stiffer penalties for officers who don't comply with investigations, the new act would clearly define duties that can only be performed by a sworn police officer, it would improve training for police services boards, and establish First Nations police services boards as well. Those are just some of the highlights of an act that actually runs, I think, more than 500 pages. So let's just go around the table here and get some initial impressions, and then we'll go into more depth. Rob, start us off. What are your thoughts? Well, we've had a chance uh, to uh, have a look at this document, and as you've mentioned, you know, there's uh, almost 500 pages uh, in this legislation. Some of the first areas of concern that we see, first and foremost, is about the engagement and true consultation with government. And having, you know, the voice of the associations be heard through that process uh, is, you know, concerning when we look at a document and we're having to learn this stuff on the fly. So some of the things that we first see, specifically around privatization of policing services, gives us great cause for concern. I'm, I'm hearing here that you don't feel you're adequately consulted during the process? Yeah, it was challenging at times to have our voices heard as, as, uh, as the voice for Frontline, and that has been uh, incredibly uh, concerning for us. Receiving this document and going through it as we are right now over the last couple of weeks, learning many things for the first mm -hmm. time. So yes, absolutely. Okay. Chairman Mike, what would you add to that from your point of view? Well, as you know, um, Nishinaabiaski Police Services is located in Northern Ontario. And uh, legislation is, we've been a part of those conversations for the last uh, few years. We've been, uh, we've been behind, uh, I guess, the driving force as well. Because as you know, uh, our police services uh, covers an area that's very remote, uh, 22 flying communities. And uh, the legislation is, uh, will really help our, um, our operations uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure and uh, personnel and also just the fact that uh, the rule of law will be uh, instilled or implemented. So in the main you like what you see? Yes. In the main. Perhaps, okay. Yeah. Good. Kingsley, how about you? Well, I have to say uh, Bad C has been fighting for change for quite some time. Bad C meaning Black, Black Action, Action Defense, Defense Committee. Committee. And I have personally been involved with this. I have challenged the government a number of occasions to take action because of the deterioration of confidence in policing in Ontario. Does this help with your confidence level, the changes they're suggesting? If implement, if passed and implemented, it will boost confidence of all peoples in Ontario in policing. Today, we are uh, beneficiaries of uh, um, the legacy of police abuse to the point we are cohorts after cohorts of black and other minority youths in uh, Toronto and elsewhere are more afraid of the police that are sworn to serve and protect than the gang leaders in the community. Interesting. Okay, more to follow up on there. Uh, Professor Kate, we got you batting cleanup here. You've heard what everybody else had to say. What are your thoughts? Um, I think on the first read, uh, it looks really good in that it's setting out what the oversight bodies do. It's 
clearly defining uh, their responsibilities and it's sorting out some overlap that existed between some of, the, some of the oversight bodies. It expands jurisdiction for one of them in particular, which I think is, is excellent. I think, so on a whole, it looks promising, um, but it seems to me that it requires quite a bit of resourcing for it to come into play. And so I'm, I'm optimistic, but concerned about if the resources will follow through. Tell me what that means. Well, if we're going to have expanding the mandate of the Office of the Independent Police Review Director um, to take over all policing complaints in the province, um, right now they are sorely understaffed to do that. Um, as it stands now, most complaints are handed back to the force that someone is complaining about. And um, police investigate themselves. Yeah, which... which is one of the main problems that we're trying to avoid in the first place. So it sounds great, um, but it seems to me that it requires quite a bit of resourcing, and that's key. One of the things, uh, obviously, every government tries to do when it does a major overhaul of something that hasn't been done in nearly three decades is to kind of find the sweet spot among all of the competing <clears throat> interests in society that want to make sure that their interests are represented in that bill. And I want to follow up with you, Rob, on whether or not the... I mean, this, this bill definitely moves to more... What's the word I want to look up? More oversight, tougher oversight of police activities. Do, in your judgment, do the, are, the, are, are the average male and female cop on the beat in this province concerned that this goes too far? Absolutely. They are. Uh, more oversight should not come at the expense of due process. And what's happening with this, and first and foremost, I just want to state that we're not against oversight, we're not against being accountable. That's, that's not it at all. And actually, I would say Mr. Justice Tulloch was one of the areas where actually we did have true consultation. Actually, I think Mr. Justice Tulloch is a good man. He had a tough job. And actually, we supported the majority of the recommendations that he put forward. Uh, where we take issue is, is when we get this document, and we see rights being stripped away from police officers. In fact, being able to give the chiefs of police the ability to fire an officer who acquires a disability, post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, me as a person who has an invisible disability, I have epilepsy. This is extremely concerning on a personal level and many of our people who have accommodations. So to send this signal uh, is incredibly concerning for the people that I represent. So the average cop on the beat who looks at this says, oh my goodness, you just made it far more difficult for me to do my job. To the point of why would you want to go into law enforcement? To, we have no issues with oversight, accountability, and then to look at this and to see the privatization aspect of things and to talk about how does privatization for for-profit companies coming in make it uh, better and safer for the citizens of Ontario. When you're talking about disturbance response, ticketing, taking away a canine and all these other specialized units and trying to implement these things, break and enters after the fact where you send these security guards out to your home where you've totally had an invasion of your privacy. Also, we believe this will not bring uh, diverse uh, communities together with the police in any way, shape or form. Well, that's okay. okay. Let me just push back a little bit on that because I'm not... Yeah. I, I, what, what you didn't add on that list is, is the cop on a Sunday afternoon making double time watching a construction crew, um, you know, do its thing. And yeah. there's no need to pay a cop double time to do that when you can pay an average citizen way less. Well, I mean, that's certainly, that's we certainly can have that conversation. But at the end of the day, uh, that officer is on their own time, generally working for uh, private companies who are paying them uh, separate and apart from the municipalities themselves. Okay. Kingsley, let me get you to come back. You now hear that... In the view of Rob, many police officers in this province are going to feel unusually uh, in the crosshairs on this one, more so than they think is comfortable for them to do their job. What's your response to that? Well, what we are seeing, we have millions of dollars paid out annually for civil suits involving police abuse. We have a number of police officers that are suspended with pay, some of them collecting more than $100,000 per year. The Sunshine List, just last summer, brought that to highlight. Uh, Constable Forsillo, the one who shot uh, Sami Yatin on the empty street car. He's alleged to have violated his bail conditions. Bail conditions. Well, he... Um, he has been on suspension for three years and collecting his full salary. 
and they are talking about shortage of money. He is convicted. He was found guilty. He is just appealing the sentence. So is it your view the police have nothing to complain about when it comes I'm not to these saying that they. I'm not saying that they have nothing to complain about. I am not, nor is Batsy, anti-police. We are anti-bad policing. But policing has become a burden on society as opposed to be there to serve and protect. It, it has departed from the key principles enunciated by Sir Robert Peel, the nine principles enunciated by Sir Robert Peel in 1929 when he founded modern policing. Let me get Kate to weigh in on this. You've heard, obviously, the police saying yeah. this is going to make our job way too tough. Obviously, you've heard Kingsley <laughs> articulate the other side. Yeah. Where's yeah. the sweet spot in all of this? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, policing in Ontario does cost more per capita than any other province. Um, we're about uh, $50 more per capita than BC. Um, and our crime rate is comparably a lot better. So that's, that's one figure to keep in mind is the cost. And so I know that municipalities are looking for ways to cut costs and hiring private security guards to, to do some of the, the work that's not core police functions is something that they've looked to do. Um, I think it's important that the Act, for the first time, defines what core police functions are, and that's important for a lot of, a lot of other things. Um, Do you have a view as to who's more right <laughs> in this argument? <laughs> oh, that's not fair. <laughs> it, it's totally not fair, which is why I asked. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, I think, I think Kings, Kingsley has a good point. Um, we live in a society in which we give up certain rights to be policed, and it's citizen um, citizen policing, as Robert Peel said, the, pe the police are the people, the people are the police. police. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that comes some restrictions on what we can do as individual citizens, and it also adds added responsibility for police officers. And of course, that comes in the form of oversight. And so do I think that the changes in oversight are going to hamper what police do? I don't think so. You don't think so? No. Okay, you've heard somebody express some skepticism at your concerns of yeah. uh, undue oversight. You want to come back on that? Well, you know, we can sit here and uh, we certainly, absolutely I do. Uh, and I say that respectfully. I, and as I said before, we're not against oversight, we're not against accountability. You know, it's interesting, I had two hats here. I was an internal affairs investigator up until 2014, so I, I see certain things. And when I speak of this, I see the stress that's put on our officers around the province. And when we talk about the expansion of the Special Investigations Unit, for example, I would argue that, in fact, they need to get their house in order first before they do that. And Who does? The Special Investigations Unit. And the issues and where we see our officers across the province being stressed tremendously, especially around mental health and well-being, mm -hmm. is the fact that they have to wait up to a year and a half to find out whether they're going to be charged criminally or not. These people live in the communities. Their names are published in the papers. Their children go to schools. We live in those communities. We, you know, and this, this act, as we see it and as we're analyzing it, um, gives us great cause for concern about stripping away uh, our basic human rights to be police officers. And I don't want to be treated, and I don't want to see anyone come in for the next 30 years of a career treated like a rag doll for 30 years mm. at the expense of uh, all these things that are happening. But privatization, to your point, though, uh, is extremely concerning to us uh, with regards to community safety. And I just can't, you know, I hope not to see a day where, you know, we're talking about break and enters after the fact, uh, uh, quote unquote, after the fact. And I can tell you, as a 23-year police officer that's been to, there's nothing, there's, it's very invasive for people who have had their homes broken into. And who is to determine that that person or those people are still not on the property in their homes, especially when you look at our model in the OPP. We, we police 324 municipalities in the province of Ontario. We're out in the rural areas. Okay, Kingsley, I see you. Yeah, and again, yeah, and then I want yeah, to hear no, Mike after I, that. I hear you. I understand yes. you. But... but um, well, what I want to look at is, yeah. when, we, when you look at all of this, a lot of policing is scope creep, scope creep. That, well, that, that's a phenomenon that exists in the bureaucracy where you have a mandate to do this and you gradually elbow yourself out and take on other things which are not mandated. So it was and valuable so, to so focus the mandate. So we need to focus it on the mission. And I think the bill intends to do this. Now, the Minister of 
Community Safety and Correctional Services in unveiling the bill. You were there. We were both there. We sat beside each other. Yeah, yes. she said um, <laughs> that when, despite all of that, when you call 911, a real police officer will show up. And I'm saying, I hope people can call 911 with, uh, with a surety that their loved ones are not going to mm. be gone down. As in the case of, um, you know, Andrew Luku, who police brought from the Don Valley Parkway and took him to his apartment at, um, uh, at Caledonia and Eglinton. And within 20 minutes, he was dead. That, that gets into police responding to people in crisis, which, in I crisis. Wanna, which I want to get to in a moment. But I haven't heard from Mike in a while. And when you said when you dial 911, you, you want the ex... to be able to feel safe that the police are going to come and they are going to be rational and reasonable and deal with the issue and yes. your loved ones would be still alive. Yes. That's if you live in a downtown of a big city. Well, in, in any anywhere. Big, anywhere in any city. I want to bring Mike in at this point because sometimes when you dial 911, uh, 500 miles north of Thunder Bay in northwestern Ontario, uh, you wait a day and a half sometimes for an officer to show up because um, it's not exactly <coughs> rapid response in a very remote part of the province. How is policing different where you're from? Well, I was uh, very interested in listening to the perspectives that are being shared here. But at the same time, too, I'm <clears throat> sitting back thinking, um, we're only 23 years old as a police service, and we uh, police are a, 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 a remote area uh, where all the communities you have to fly in. And um, when we used to uh, bring in new recruits to to go to go to their uh, postings, I used to use the uh, the analogy of the uh, the French Foreign Legion because that's the best way I could describe for them to have an understanding where they're going. This is where you are today. We trained you. Now we're going to ship you out, and uh, we won't see you for a while, <laughs> because that's how remote it is, say. Eh? And uh, this uh, bill that we we speak of, um, it's something that was badly needed. Uh, we should have had it in the first place when we started, but um, we were operating under a program. We it was uh, a service that did not have any any backing whatsoever, any um, uh, even accountability. Mike, uh, do you think that there is a higher level of acceptance among Indigenous people in Northwestern Ontario, for example, when an Indigenous police officer with naps shows up as opposed to someone who looks like him or me? Well, back in, uh, back in the remote areas, you're more familiar with each other because each, re each location, each remote site uh, uh, once you enter the community, you're part of a family. So mm -hmm. it's it's uh, something that's normal. But uh, from a, uh, an urban area, I guess uh, it's it might be different, a total different perspective. And that's something we're not too accustomed with uh, because we're busy dealing with our own communities and trying to build a police service that, uh, that will uh, be able to function as a, a fully resourced police service. Understood. I want to follow up now, Kingsley, on what you were saying a moment ago, and that is talking about police responses to people in crisis. And yes. here's what a former Supreme Court Justice named Frank Iacobucci, who did a review of the police services dealings with people in crisis a few years ago. Here's what he had to say. Sheldon, you want to bring this graphic up? There will not be great improvements in police encounters with people in crisis without the participation of agencies and institutions of municipal, provincial, and federal governments because, simply put, they are part of the problem and need to be involved in the solution. Okay, Rob, start us off on this. How would you gauge right now, in advance of the changes that have been made in this new Safer Ontario Act, the police services of this province's ability to respond to people in crisis? I think we do a, a tremendous job. We, a lot of the times we only hear about the, the times that there is a problem. Uh, officers are dealing in our, our civilian uh, members of law enforcement, our dispatchers, call takers. We deal uh, very well with people in crisis across this province. And I know uh, the Ontario Police College teaches de-escalation. We teach that at the Provincial Police Academy as well. I think part of the problem, and I totally agree with uh, the Honourable uh, Mr. Akabuchi in the sense that uh, 
uh, more needs to be done with multiple stakeholders. It seems that in many ways the police are the default. We need to be investing more in mental health uh, in this province to, uh, to deal with that and to support people that are in crisis. Uh, officers are, are, are heavily involved with these calls on a daily basis and more times than not we deal quite successfully you feel uh, Kingsley more, with those people. You feel you're more like a social worker than a police officer from well, time to time? Well I think being a police officer is in part being a social worker. Having said that, I'm more than willing to have the, the debate or the discussion around core responsibilities of policing. I think we need to have that discussion, but we need to listen to the police associations because we represent the voice of the front line. There On the other hand, please. if I would jump in here, my first career was in mental health. I used to be a psychiatric nurse. So I've worked with people in all kinds of situations and have been, and have de-escalated and uh, mobilized, de immobilized people who are direct threats and dangers to me. I have had worked with clients with a knife stuck at my throat like this, and I'm calling for emer emergency assistance uh, from at a hospital to say, we need somebody to see this person, and she's saying, say the wrong word. And I work through that and take her to the hospital. So what do you know that some so, police officers So don't what know? we are saying, it is, this whole area of crisis intervention is psychology-based. Police, no individual or category of individual or profession can be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. Policing. A police officer gets 12 weeks of training at the police college, and then they're given a badge and a gun. Not enough time? A, the minimum training that anyone in the human service gets is a two-year college diploma. Kate, let me bring you in here, because uh, obviously when these situations of police responding to people in crisis mm -hmm. go south, we hear all about it, and the consequences are tragic. In the main, in your view, are the police adequately trained, and they, do they do a satisfactory enough job responding to the large numbers of people in crisis that they encounter on their jobs? First, I would just like to kind of pull back to something that Rob said, in that it's unfortunate that when we're dealing with people with mental health disability, that the police are the first people to be there, because that's not their specialty, dealing with people with mental health issues or people in crisis. Um, so first, first of all, I think we need to rethink how we treat people with mental illness in the first place. Um, but secondly, looking at the changes being made, I noticed nowhere in the act is anything about mental health. Um, and so currently, each force can set its own policies and procedures. I know Toronto Police followed the Yakabuchi report and implemented many of his recommendations. But to me, it seems like the, the, this act was a missed opportunity in setting a province-wide standard in how we deal with individuals in mental health crisis or individuals with um, mental health disability. If you, um, could, if mm -hmm. you could have your way, yeah. the first person to respond to a person in crisis potentially acting violently in a, in a situation where mental health issues are clearly at play, <laughs> Ought to be who? <laughs> I mean, it's. I think that it's a health. Uh, it's a health question. It's a question of health. A healthcare professional should be there. Not Certainly, I don't officer. want to put people at risk. Um, but police are good at their jobs. That is not their expertise. Their expertise is not dealing with people with mental health. Certainly, they have to on a daily basis. But that's not their core function. Mike. No, I'm glad uh, you're. Uh point that out because um, the communities that we service, uh, the legacy that's left behind or the legacy that's been uh, imparted through uh, assimilation, um, residential school, 60 scoop, there's a whole slew of issues that people are dealing with and they, have, they haven't had time to, uh, to uh, be able to deal with them. So there's a lot of underlying issues of, about anger, depression, and a, a whole gamut of things. And those are the things that our constables uh, confront are confronted with. And that's one of the reasons I got involved as well is um, one of my, uh, one of our constables in our community came up to me and she was in tears saying, that I can't fight this off, I can't get over this. Uh, 
And at the time, uh, this was back in 1998, only four years of uh, police servicing uh, the communities as a police service. I was blown away, like, um, this was a mental health issue that she was talking about uh, as a result of dealing with something that she wasn't prepared for. Was she indigenous or non-indigenous? She was indigenous. She was, she was indigenous. part of the community. And still had difficulty processing the whole thing. Yeah, because mm. we had not thought of those things. We had not prepared our constables for that. Rob, do the changes that are proposed in this updated Police Services Act do, in your judgment, a more thorough job of holding police officers accountable when dealing with people in crisis and it goes south? You know, that's, uh, you know, I, I think clearly as it's proposed, I think that there's uh, the level of oversight and accountability. As I said, you know, we, we certainly supported the vast majority of the recommendations by Mr. Justice Tullock, who I think had a tough job and did a good job. Uh, it has gone to the point of, you know, uh, you know, and I and I know there's not necessarily always the support. I, although I do believe the vast majority of the citizens in the province support what we do, um, but the oversight has gotten to the point of, uh, you know, it's concerning for folks that are put into volatile situations. You look at officers who are exposed with post-traumatic stress disorder and the things that we're facing. You look at uh, officer suicides, which is disproportionate to everything else. Look at the things that we're dealing with. And when you're talking about oversight going to a level, which in some cases isn't even humanly possible to be perfect, in our position is if there's something in the act that supports our Indigenous brothers and sisters in those communities, the OPP are intricate in those communities. I've personally worked in Pekanjikum First Nation. I think that's a great thing. Um, and if there's something in there that works for, for you and your people in those communities, that's good stuff. The stuff we're talking about specifically applies to you know the labor relations, employment law, and all these other things. Will it, uh, will it bring us together and want us to engage further? We could get into a full debate on uh, some of the legislation that's come out from the government in the last year, uh, which really is shutting down, I believe, in conversations in some ways. Yeah. How do you, Kingsley, want to deal with the fact that while you want additional oversight, dealing with the police who may make mistakes with people in crisis and compare that set of concerns with the set of concerns Rob just raised, which is he feels his officers are being way overly pressurized uh, to, or pressured, I guess, um, uh, with a level of oversight that uh, is too much on them. Well, when you have certain um, practices that you are engaged with over time, it becomes the way of doing business. And you don't want to surrender any of that. So you think they've got some bad habits they have to unlearn? Well, put it this way. They have acquired a lot of bad habits, like the brutality we saw, for instance, just out in, uh, just a few months ago, where the SIU arrested a Toronto cop out in Whitby for beating a guy to pulp, beating his eye out of his head. And the Durham police were called, and they, in turn, threw him on the hood of a car, searched him with broken bones, his eye hanging out his head, and then they banwagged him with a whole lot of charges about, uh, and this type of thing and did not report it. He, he was off duty. He lives out there. He, um, and then there was a cover-up by both the Durham and the Toronto police of, of this uh, issue. And so it was the criminal defense lawyer, the civil lawyer who, who they hired that brought it to the attention of now, now I have, I've got to jump in here because yeah. th there are always going to be anomalies, right? There are always absolutely. going to be bad so, apples in the barrel. Absolutely. So but I want to make said, sure I understand what you're saying. But when you have one rotten apple in the barrel and you don't take it out, every other apple in there is subject to get rotten. Do you want to comment on that yeah, metaphor? Well, the vast majority of our officers and civilians of law enforcement are great people. It's the law of averages. And, and you know what, you're, to, to your point there about taking the rotten apple out, as I said in the beginning, we're not against accountability, we're not against oversight. And in that case, I would say that the, uh, the process is working its way through. I don't know all the facts and details. I'm not part of the Durham Regional Police Force or the Toronto Police. Well, that's but, just one but, example, though. No, I understand. But, 
but when you're talking about exactly, it's only one example, but we have thousands of officers. I represent the largest police association standalone in the country, and we have thousands of officers and civilians of law enforcement that go out there each and every day, put their lives on the line in violent situations. And we can sit here and talk about the one-offs and stuff, to your point, Steve, uh, or we can talk about the thousands of successful outcomes each and every day. It's the law of averages. We have some incredible people. Absolutely. I would not dispute that. And let me say this. I have worked in occupations where I've worked very closely with the police and where my life depended on working with the police. Mm -hmm. I've worked as a probation and parole officer. I've worked as a child protection officer. I've worked as a child uh, abuse specialist only investigating child abuse and those kind of things where we do the interviews jointly with police officers and those type of things and so on. And as a matter of fact, I was dealing with a situation in Ross River, Yukon, where I had apprehended these kids from these parents because of an abuse situation and got them to alcohol and drug uh, treatment and got them back and then returned the kids to them and was there on a supervision visit with the RCMP. Uh, and I was locked in the house and the RCMP drove away and left me there. <laughs> so what, uh, what, yeah, so I, I can tell you, so my life has depended on it. So I have nothing to say about the police that is not factual. I'm saying there are good people in there, but I can tell you this. To withstand the pressures of the peer group or the coach officer, when you are a rookie and you are assigned to a coach officer, and that coach officer has bad habits and do these things, uh, if you want to be a cop, you do what he does and say, and does what he says. Otherwise, you won't be there. So it, this behavior is transferred to the people that they coach. Okay, I'm jumping in here for a sec because we're literally down to our last minute and I need a good political scientist, which I happen to have right here, <laughs> to comment on this. I want to, I wa in your judgment, mm -hmm. I want to know how influential do you think Black Action Defense Committee, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. these other citizen organizations have been in the crafting of what is now the so-called Safer Ontario Act. I think they were instrumental. Um, I know that Black Lives Matter was camping out in, in response to the Andrew Loku shooting and SIU's not releasing the report. And um, Mr. Justice Tullock was asked to look into SIU along with the other police oversight bodies. I think they played a very important role in bringing public attention to a very tragic, very tragic case. Um, so I think they play a big part of it, and I'm glad to see that Mr. Justice Tullock um, consulted with many of them. He consulted with thousands of people, but included the key stakeholders. So I think they do play a key role here. Kate gets the last word on this program. That's our time, everybody. I'm grateful to all of you for coming into TVO tonight, helping us out with this. Uh, there's Mike Metatawabin. Nishnabi Aski Police Service, NAPS for short. He's the board chair there. And Rob Jamison, who's the president of the Ontario Provincial Police Association. And on the other side of the table, Kate Puttister, assistant professor, political science, University of Guelph. Kingsley Gilliam, the director of communications for the Black Action Defense Committee. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate your time tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.